Leaked information stealing malware logs have exposed thousands of pedophiles online, revealing new dimensions of law enforcement investigations that leverage stolen credentials to unmask child abusers. In other news, Twilio's unsecured API endpoint allowed hackers to verify over 33 million MFA phone numbers, exposing users to potential SMS phishing as well as SIM swapping attacks. How did these hackers exploit Twilio's unsecured API and what measures can be taken to safeguard against similar attacks? And finally, Microsoft researchers have identified critical vulnerabilities in Rockwell Automation PanelView Plus devices that could allow unauthenticated hackers to remotely execute code or cause denial of service attacks. What specific mitigation steps can be implemented to protect from these vulnerabilities? You're listening to The Daily Decrypt. Starting things off with a doozy, all right? Thousands of pedophiles were identified by law enforcement by using InfoStealer malware logs leaked on the dark web. What a headline, right? So let's talk about this a little bit. Security researchers at InSync Group identified 3,324 unique accounts that access child sexual abuse material, or CSAM, sites by analyzing data stolen by malware, like Redline, Raccoon, and VDAR. The data included credentials, IP addresses, and system information. This stolen data allowed investigators to link CSAM users to their legal online accounts such as email, banking, and social media, which ultimately led to multiple arrests by unmasking individuals' identities. So these security researchers were looking to develop a proof of concept, proving that these pedophiles could be identified using InfoStealer malware logs. And so what they did was they went to the Recorded Future Intelligence Cloud, which is essentially a service that monitors the dark web for information on corporations' employees, which includes dumps of InfoStealer logs, but also like compromised passwords, credentials, etc. The whole service that you can get for free on Have I Been Pwned. But through this research, by using just collections of InfoStealer logs that have been leaked on the dark web, they were able to prove that they could link true identities of these pedophiles to the things they partook in online. And they were able to do this because information stealing malware collects a wide range of data, including browser history, cookies, autofill data, cryptocurrency wallet information, and system details. So you can see how this information would be valued to an adversary, right? We've got all kinds of credentials. You can get screenshots from this thing. You can get cookies, session cookies, so you can log right in without having to enter in usernames and passwords. It's very valuable information. But these researchers realized that also you're able to see when criminals or pedophiles are doing criminal acts on the internet, right? Because of browser cookies and all that stuff. And so they took this information and they cross-referenced it against stolen credentials for known child pornography sites or CSAM sites, which provided them with 3,324 unique username and password pairs. So between these two sets of data, they have everything they need to identify real life identities of these pedophiles, which can then of course be turned over to law enforcement. And so a lot of the things we talk about on this podcast are in regards to criminals like ransomware artists or hackers or attackers or whatever you want to call them, right? But there can sometimes be a gray line where the law and sort of ethical morals differ, right? Like hacking isn't always purely malicious. It can be done for good too, like penetration testing and stuff like that. There's there's a lot of gray lines in hacking. When it comes to pedophilia and sex offenders, there's not much of a gray line. There, it, it, There's not a single group of people that respects pedophiles, right? Everyone hates them, including hackers. And so this information was obtained after InfoStealer logs were leaked on the dark web, right? And then databases bought them up and sell services to monitor InfoStealer logs, right? So it's a whole ecosystem. But I wonder what would happen if there was a sort of black box where hackers could distribute these InfoStealer logs to the FBI or to law enforcement in more like a real-time scenario, right? Where it's done anonymously and it helps to catch and get these people off the internet. I don't know if hackers would go for it. Law enforcement have to be pretty creative to come up with a system that, that hackers would trust. And if you are listening to my voice and you have any ideas, please comment on our YouTube or Spotify or send us a message on Instagram because we'd love to hear these ideas. Hackers have exploited an unsecured API endpoint 
to verify millions of authy MFA phone numbers. A threat actor named Shiny Hunters leaked a CSV file with 33 million phone numbers registered with the authy service. This file includes account IDs, phone numbers, account statuses, and device counts. Twilio has confirmed the breach and secured the compromised API endpoint, and they're also claiming that they have no further evidence of system breaches, but they do recommend updating to the latest Authy Android version 25.1.0 and iOS version 26.1.0 for enhanced security. So why is this bad? Like, why do I care if someone has my phone number and my device count and my account status? Why do I care? Well, on a smaller level, you probably don't, right? If someone wanted to personally target you, they could find your phone number pretty easily through a couple quick OSINT Google searches or Facebook or yellowpages.com or cybersecurity background checks. They, they could find it pretty easily. But this isn't about individual attacks. This is about more automated attacks. Though this information could be used in an individual attack pretty easily, attackers are essentially now able to correlate your phone number with a service that you use, right? So if you're using Twilio, and you use your phone number for multi-factor authentication codes, hackers can use that information against you. Maybe they craft some sort of phishing message, like, hey, your phone has been disconnected as a multi-factor authentication device on your Twilio account. Click this link to re-enable it. Otherwise, your account will not be secure anymore. Your brain will immediately think like, hey, who knows that I have Twilio? Only Twilio knows that I'm using this number as multi-factor authentication. So you don't really think as critically about that text message as you might, right? Like it's if you have a very niche bank and they send you like, hey, someone's trying to log into your account, click here to approve or deny. And they provide some sort of other information about your account, like the last four digits or the email associated with the account or something like that. You trust it immediately. And this is one of the reasons cybersecurity professionals claim that SMS-based multi-factor authentication is far less secure than app-based. Like anything is better than nothing. So if you have to use SMS-based multi-factor authentication, yes, great. But anyone can send you a text message and attackers can be pretty creative. And now the main reason we don't like SMS-based multi-factor authentication is for a thing called SIM swapping, which is where an attacker will call up your mobile phone carrier and try to convince them to switch your number to their device. And then they can receive those text messages and log in as you. But the last thing I wanna drill home is that as a result of this breach, attackers now know that you use this service and that you use this number for multi-factor authentication. And so they can then go attempt to log in. Maybe they have some breached credentials on you from a different site that you've reused in Twilio. They can go attempt to log in can use social engineering techniques to try to get you to share that code with them from your phone number, or they can attempt to SIM swap you. It just increases the ability that you can be attacked. And we don't love that. And finally, Microsoft is warning that Rockwell Automation's Panel View Plus devices, commonly used in industrial settings, have critical vulnerabilities that could lead to remote code execution and denial of service. So these vulnerabilities were discovered and patched late last year. So this isn't necessarily news about these vulnerabilities, but Microsoft is mostly warning about an increased security risk against this type of attack, as in they've been seeing this more and more. And so if you're a Panel Plus view user, make sure to update as soon as possible because this could be very bad. These have very high severity scores, 9.8 out of 10, I believe, and patches are available. So heed Microsoft's warning and update as soon as possible. This has been The Daily Decrypt. If you found your key to unlocking the digital domain, show your support with a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It truly helps us stand at the frontier of cyber news. Don't forget to connect on Instagram or catch our episodes on YouTube. Until next time, keep your data safe and your curiosity alive.